welcome to the start of Grind. We're just going to kick it off, Dylan, I suppose, really just to start off where we obviously know that you went, you're a, a graduate of Trinity College and a lot of people would have thought that you came from the computing school there, but that's not quite the case. No, but it is a rumour I like to sort <laughs> of uh, get people to talk about a lot. Um, yeah, people, uh, people often accuse me of having done computer science or computer engineering or frankly anything reasonably intelligent from Trinity. Uh, actually, I studied business and politics. Okay. I was just a big, I, I was and like to think I remain a big nerd. Okay, and tell us, there was actually, I know it sounds like a cliched question, but it's really one that we always kind of need to ask as an Oprah. What was it that really got you to discover whether well, you had an entrepreneurial itch at that early stage in your career? What were the forces in college that mm -hmm. kind of influenced you to actually have your first venture and kind of um, launch from there on? It was mostly um, management lectures on Friday morning that I really oh, didn't I want to go so, to. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It was more looking around and seeing opportunities. And, and I was in college from, what, 98 to 2002 uh, during the first internet boom and subsequent crash. Mm -hmm. So I think we got to see a lot of, a lot of what... Um, you got to see a lot of people trying a lot of things outside of college. And it was pretty influential, I think, in us starting our first company there. Okay. And you launched what became known as Forest out of college. Can you tell us more about what that was and, and how it all came together? Yeah, well, Forest today is... Uh, CEO'd by Ronan, the biggest appointment software company for beauty salons in Ireland, and I think they're number two in the UK. Um, the reason I sort of say that as a, as, a, as a starting point, I guess, is that, what, 10 years ago when we started it in college, uh, we started it as a text messaging service primarily for club promoters. Um, and you asked me earlier, tell me a funny story about how we actually started it. Well. The, the truth behind how we started Forest, and I swear to God, I'm not making this up. We, we went in to one of the, the marketing agencies around Dublin who did a lot of work on campus, and we said to them, hey, we've got this awesome product. You're going to love it. It lets you send text messages to loads and loads of people who have opted in. They said, fantastic. We'll, we'll buy it. How much? And we said a number. And they said, great. Um, half an hour later, they sent out the purchase order. And myself and Sean and Ronan looked at each other, and we went, bollocks. Now we've got to build it. Um, true story. Sold it before we'd even built it. Um, this is often the case. And we, uh, we grew the company uh, essentially off the back of that in college. It became pretty big in the text messaging field. Again, for those of you who are slightly on the younger side of the spectrum, this was back when text messaging was really just starting to take a hold um, in the world. And a lot of people thought that it was only going to be a so-so medium or maybe a little bit of a niche kind of play. Uh, we saw it getting massive traction in college really, really early on. We said, okay, this is going to be big. Let's get into the middle of it. Let's try and connect companies with it. And we grew it from there. Uh, we also managed to get into a lot of the political parties very early on. So I think we had most political parties in this country using our platform again whilst we were still in college. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people like to think that was down to our amazing sales technique. And again, happy to encourage that myth. Um, in reality, what we did was we went in and we sat down with some of the senior political figures in each of the parties and we said, hello, we would like to make a donation. And they said, oh, that's great. We would like to donate our text messaging software. And they all went for it. And we got, true story, we got, we got all the political parties, or most of them on board, I think, early on. By, by, and then we started charging them eventually down the line. Yeah, like I'm only, I suppose, a couple of years out of college myself and I could have never imagined myself doing enterprise sales in college. Tell us, are there any kind of... Can you tell us some of the stories from back in that time? Because I imagine it was those, pretty Those were just two of the stories, <laughs> dude. <laughs> like, like, can stuff. you tell us, like, donating That's my software. A material. Yeah, but in um, terms of, um, of actually going into commercial companies and selling systems, um, that's not something that you're it is, it is. No, it is mostly about <laughs> pretending to be much, much larger than you actually are. Mm. Um, I mean, we were literally operating it from Ronan's bedroom and in between lectures. Mm. And, you know, enterprise sales in pretty much any sector tends to take a while and lots of validation and things like that. So we were doing it really at a much, much lower scale, mm -hmm. but it was still fundamentally selling to a business as opposed to a consumer. Yeah. Um, so it, I think in every company that I've been involved with, it is always about playing the smoke and mirrors game, making sure that you come across as being as professional as you can be and about you know five to 10 times larger than you actually are. Companies don't like to buy from small companies normally. There's exceptions to that. That's a good general rule um, to have. So you've always, you know, no, one's, no one wants to think that they're taking a big risk with the product yeah. that they're buying from somebody. So 
like in terms of how you built that business up in college, how big was it by the time you left Trinity? Like obviously it must have affected your life uh, lifestyle and you must have had plenty of cash to go out on the weekends and do what you wanted or, no, or did it, it inspire you to do it more? Was, kind it, was, of it was more about answering phones late at night because yeah. something had broken. Um, I mean it was, I, I honestly can't remember how many text messages we were sending a month but it was in the millions I think. Um, I honestly can't remember. It wasn't like our KPIs were, were really based on, on chasing revenue and chasing cash okay. rather than how many messages we were sending. We had a lot of people using it, but it was still very, very, very bootstrapped. And we kind of had to make a decision about whether we were going to go with that or whether we were going to go and do something else, which had a more of a global outlook, mm -hmm. whereas this was, was, was more of a domestic one. And neither was right or, or neither one was right or wrong. Yeah. We just had different aspirations at the time. And, and Ronan took that and, and has turned it into something amazing. Um, you know, it took a really, really hard sector, the beauty space, yeah. built out software on top of it, and, and, and they now process huge amounts of data um, for the beauty industry. Plus, he's got the best haircut that I know. Okay. Because well, on that point, speaking jealous. of speaking of um, you know partnerships and, and having co-founders and so on, obviously you the, you were you guys were all friends in college, I imagine. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you've learned over the years in terms of you've started three companies now in your fourth, I believe. Is that about right? Three well, and a half? Approximately, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll get so it right one day. Tell us what the checks are in, that you have for people that you go into business with. I mean, what, are the, what are the key cornerstones of what makes a good partnership? And do you have any checks that you can do to make sure that they're... <laughs> they're, they're um, There's a lot of stories I can't tell right at reason. this juncture. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it takes a long time to know people, um, which is the unfortunate truth of, of, of trying to find people to start companies with. In general, um, friends and family are pretty much the worst idea um, to start founders mm -hmm. with. Uh, we were lucky. I mean, myself and, and Sean in Demonware, I mean, we had ups and downs, but you know, it worked out very, very well. We're still extremely good friends. Um, Ronan, the same, but it, it's not easy. Like any of you who run companies or who are starting companies, you'll either appreciate or be beginning to appreciate the sheer emotional roller coaster that, that you go through on that. Yeah. And that is hard on any relationship or any friendship. So you have to you have to be able to trust people. So I mean, you know, I found over the years that even a hint of paranoia in people mm -hmm. and I immediately red flag it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because it, you, you can't have that. You have to be able to trust people utterly and, 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 and implicitly, and there's, there's, there's no getting around it. I think you need to have a balance if, if there's, uh, generally I think you should have at least two founders, ideally maybe three, because there's always moments where you stop believing or you're down or you're pissed off or you're sad or all of the above, and someone else has to be able to step in mm -hmm. to carry it, right? There's, there's an emotional sharing that goes on of that load, because it, it really is quite a lot. And you need to have hung out with people or worked with people enough to know that, okay, between the three of you, there'll be someone who will step up if the other two are down yeah. or, the, or, or two when one is down. Okay. I think you've got to have that. I'd love to give you a silver bullet answer saying, well, actually, these five things in your grant. But the reality is, is, is much more complicated. I mean, there is a reason that founder disagreement is the thing that kills most startups. You know, it's a really hard thing to, to, to get right. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if you've had the luxury of working with someone for years and you still get on mm -hmm. and you still laugh and you still go for drinks and you don't punch each other in the face, you know, that's a very good starting point. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell us about what you're doing now. You're, um, you're in the UK from what it seems and you've actually, uh, you started Box of Awesome, which is kind of like a subscription kind of mail out thing in the last few months. Tell us more about that because it was doing, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Damned by faint praise. Um, yeah, it's actually, it's, um, so we, we started this company called, well, it's now called Super Awesome, um, modest, um, to solve a big problem that we saw emerging. I, I've kind of moved from being involved with and, and investing in video games companies, I suppose, over the last few years, more into um, the general kids space because we see, I see a lot of disruption coming down the line. And one of the big problems that I started to see and hear from media companies and content companies and just about any company operating there was that um, uh, discovery was getting really, really, really hard for brands when they're communicating with kids. And everyone knows that. There's huge, vast amounts of content out there. And if you're, you know, regardless of whether you're Disney or whether you're a small startup that no one's heard of, it's, you've got the same fundamental problem of breaking through. Yeah. 
At the same time, you have got huge platform fragmentation. So five or six or seven or eight years ago, if you were doing a big marketing program for kids, you know, you could put all your money into TV and into retail, boom, you'd be done. Now kids are on, you know, three, four different platforms, um, most simultaneously, they're physical, they're digital. You've got a lot of companies who are operating, you know, sometimes appropriately, sometimes not appropriately. So our view on it was, okay, you know, this is a market that, um, that needs to be treated effectively. It needs mm -hmm. to be treated safely. Kids are very important. It's critical that marketing is done, you know, in a compliant kind of way, mm -hmm. but also in a, in a way that addresses the fact that kids have moved on mm -hmm. from what they were like five years ago. So we decided to build a media company based on this. Um, good timing. <laughs> um, uh, it is based on mobile. Um, it is based on, <laughs> see what I did there? Thanks. Um, it's based we on, haven't planted there, but it's based on it's uh, it's based on browser and it's based on physical. Essentially, it is everywhere that kids are. We have built a platform, and to the to, we we work with oh countless brands in the UK. We now reach about eight million kids a month um, across our ad network on mobile in our discovery boxes, mm -hmm. um, which we originally started with and, and, and through our research. Um, and essentially, we, we're becoming the next generation marketing infrastructure for kids. Okay, and do you see yourself as a competitor of, say, Nickelodeon and a lot of the kind of bigger kids' brands in the States? You are not going to ask me publicly <laughs> if we compete with Nickelodeon. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Nickelodeon are a good and trusted client. We love you. Um, we compete with... It's a uh, complex relationship. <laughs> there's a lot of frenemies in our industry. Um, we, there are a lot of marketing um, companies who, are, uh, who use a lot of very traditional channels that haven't changed in a long time. Um, we are very much forward-looking. We have lots of new channels. Um, so we work together with companies like Nickelodeon, Disney, Hasbro, Mattel, all of the big kids' companies that you know. Mm -hmm. um, but at some level, yeah, we compete with them. We arguably compete with YouTube, Miniclip. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you all know where kids are. They're essentially everywhere. And um, we are a pure play kids platform. So okay. we compete with essentially the internet. Um, you know, an easy thing to do, right? So you came out of Trinity, um, presumably, presumably you were still with Forest at that time. Yep. Um, you went on then to launch Demonware, am that right? Yep. So tell us about Demonware, because I know that that was a gaming sort of platform. Um, how did that, and a lot of that industry, the epicenter is around Silicon Valley and around different parts of the States. Um, so you presumably had to move out of Ireland to get customers and so on. Can you tell us a little bit more about, first of all, how you identified that as the next kind of venture and what were the first kind of significant and kind of practical steps to getting into those markets? Because four young boys or a few young guys from Dublin uh, just going out to conquer the world. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. one of the first big steps you take. Um, well, what the, the very first, well, the Demonware came about because Sean, uh, Sean Blanchfield, um, he was doing a lot of research into peer-to-peer -peer networking. So at the time, Napster, for those of you that remember, Napster was blowing up and, and everyone was talking about distributed networks and peer-to-peer -peer networks. And Sean had been doing a PhD in that area. And we were playing a lot of, between Forest and Lectures, we were playing a lot of um, multiplayer Counter-Strike. And we thought, hey, this multiplayer gaming, it's actually fun. We see lots of our friends doing it. We think it could be big. Um, and Sean's um, research was on this kind of next generation um, network uh, technology so we thought well you know this is where gaming is going multiplayer is going to be big it's going to need better technology we know about better technology we can go and do that and so we went out and we punched uh, or punched <laughs> pitched <laughs> uh, if that's not a freudian slip i don't know what <laughs> we pitched a lot of investors um and um <laughs> sometimes the other thing too um and said hey this is where we see the future going multiplayer gaming going to be huge trust us and we got laughed out of lots and lots of meetings. They said, hey, multiplayer, it'll be niche, it'll be small, you know, whatever. Um, and we said, well, screw you, we're going to go and show you otherwise. So the money we, we, myself and Sean had made out of Forest, we essentially spent it flying around the world, talking to a lot of game studios. So we flew to all the big game studios, mostly in North America. It was the most insane schedule I've ever seen in my life. Um, and we got a lot of people very drunk, and we got them to tell us all of their problems. Uh, these were the programmers in studios who were making a lot of these games. And this would have been 2002, 2003. Interesting approach to customer development. Getting yeah. people drunk always works. <laughs> they will tell you all sorts of things. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's a valid business strategy in my view. Um, and based on that, we kind of came back and we went, okay, here's what we thought. Here's what these people are actually telling us they'd pay money for. There is a real thing here. 
So we went and raised, raised uh, some investment in Ireland properly this time in 2003, which was the wow, one of the worst times in the world in this country to raise VC. I mean, it was post dot com one uh, meltdown. It was awful, but we raised the money and, and got out. And um, tell us, was that a hard slog to raise that money, or, or how did you go about it? Did you raise it in it Ireland? Was, and if so, it was brutal. We pitched everyone in the country, and I mean, every like we were going to farmers in random parts of Mayo that I've never heard of, trying to explain to this dude who was rounding up sheep <laughs> what peer to peer networking was and why Counter Strike was going to be an important thing. Um, I, true story, and. Um, so yeah, it was, it was tough, but we got it. And, and we raised like a bunch of money on the back of literally a business plan um, and, and a, a whole bunch of kind of customers or potential customers saying, yeah, look, if this existed, sure, we'd buy it. Um, and then we got into a room, we all looked at each other and we went, shit, what are we gonna do now? We've got the money, I guess we have to build it. Um, so we, we had a, a small, very small team of guys from Trinity, remarkably talented dudes. And we, we, um, we started building a, what, what became a very, very good network product. In fact, it was so good that it was actually about three years ahead of its time. Because when we went back to the original customers, we had this amazing network engine, which did really, really cool stuff. And all the studios looked at it and went, eh, that's lovely, but we just want this bit here, thanks. And we went, mm, okay. And then we went to the next studio and the same thing happened in the next studio. After about the 10th studio, we sort of got the message. And we kind of rejigged the product for a much, much simpler version, uh, which was kind of the lobby uh, matchmaking uh, service and that was the thing that really started to blow us up okay um, and then eventually the market kind of caught up with the particularly sophisticated piece of network technology we'd built yeah. um, and that, that's kind of how it started yeah that's that's one of the things we kind of notice in Lucy because we talk to a lot of people with ideas and a lot of people come to us with amazing ideas and really rational kind of views as to how these ideas will work um, but they have these incredibly I suppose elaborate plans of how they're going to build a product and all the different hundreds of features it's going to have. Um, did you ever learn that the hard way? Did you ever learn that by maybe releasing a huge product to a, to a market and realizing, oh shit, that was absolutely not what we should have done? Just kind of like there, but did you ever do it without kind of doing it? Are you just going to ask me questions little, after I've given the answer? Did, 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 did you ever do it like... Um, it's like Jeopardy. With, with the text. What is... <laughs> what I mean is, is like, did you... Have you ever released a product that... Have so we ever made a balls of releasing a product yeah, is what basically. you want to ask. Yeah, tons of times. Um, well, we generally, like, the, in Demonware, well, I suppose in a few companies, I get accused of this a lot, of just making up products and announcing them and everyone going, we haven't built it yet. Telling the truth in advance, as we like to call it. In this, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's, it's like, it's temporal, you know, uh, product development, as in it will be a product at some point. Um, we, we did a lot more of that, and that's kind of interesting because you know when you like we um, when we, we announced our matchmaking product, the lobby product, uh, the thing that actually connects players up around the world. Um, uh, at it was one of the conferences. I can't remember which year it was. Yeah. You know, and Sean had actually started properly architecting it out of the the big huge behemoth that we built. And he sort of, I remember his estimate was something like, oh, six or seven weeks, you know? <laughs> I said, okay, fine, we announced it at the, at the conference. Um, and we did, we announced it at the conference, and we got all these people signing up. Four months later, <laughs> we eventually had something to give them um, that was vaguely usable, um, but very, very early. So, uh, you know, that we, we've often sort of been caught in the back foot by doing that. But it's a very good way of getting, like just hacking through what people actually want. Mm -hmm. Announce something and you know, if you got, as long as you've got some sort of vague basis for the product, mm -hmm. it's, it's a risky but effective way of finding out whether the market is, is interested. I think in terms of building something really big and really developed um, that people wanted, um, I think in Jolt when we were building social games, um, we, we did a lot of that. I mean, it was, that's a consumer play, so it's a little bit different. Yeah. You know, with games, I think you tend to forget that people often just want a really simple, fun thing. And they don't really give a shit about a lot of the stuff around it unless they're, you know, a hardcore it's player. It's a killer feature. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you was actually what you're doing with Super Awesome, where you want to eventually, you tell me, want to become the biggest discovery platform for kids' brands in the world. Um, You've actually been doing that and you've actually recently acquired a company that has a lot of that uh, infrastructure. Um, awesome. And growth by acquisition doesn't seem to be one of the kind of more, I suppose, viable or kind of common <laughs> avenues that startups take for a number of very obvious reasons. But um, 
How have you found that process and how did you identify which was the right company to buy and that it could actually be done and that operationally you could make these this company that you're building and this company that you're going to buy um, merge? Yeah, this, <laughs> th th this is why I'm a VC's nightmare somewhere yeah. sometimes because I, I don't really play by convention. Um, so we, we started with Super Awesome, we started with one company, we bought another, we actually made another acquihire recently, which we haven't announced yet on the mobile okay. side to pull it in. But essentially, we, you know, we're now the biggest, I mean, to give you a sense of scale, I guess, we're, we're the biggest um, discovery platform in the UK for kids. We reach about 8 million kids a month um, through, our, through our various networks. Um, so we're, we're genuinely bigger than everyone on the digital side in the UK. Okay. Um, and you know, when you acquire, I think a lot of people are nervous about acquisitions because a lot of them haven't done it before. And they think, oh, you know, you're just going to buy something and it's not going to work and yeah. everything else. So we spent a huge amount of time with, with, um, with the guys on Swap It before we pulled the trigger on it. We were working together on a lot of little projects. Uh, we'd gone out and gotten drunk a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew each other pretty well before we did it. And I, I think, you know, the, my view on companies is, look, you're, you're trying to get from A to B. I think that there's a lot of writing in, in Silicon Valley about linear product growth, that you do this thing and then this thing and then you add these features and there you are. Mm -hmm. The reality is usually a lot messier than that. Um, and I like to find alternative routes of getting there faster. And if there's something that, that, that we can take which fits in that gives us market dominance and gets us to a certain point quicker than anyone else, then sure, we'll look at it. You know? And do you see it as a... I know it sounds like it's not going to be the case, but do you see it as a, a more viable option for startups to to grow by acquisition um, than might be perceived? I mean, how are there any clever ways you can engineer it to work in startups' favor if they raise some seed money and they can they then they go and can they re basically if they're a two or three man band and they want to buy someone who has a load of customers? Um, do you think that it's it's a viable option to go to a VC and say, look, we want to att we want to attack the market hard and we want to actually acquire this vehicle to do it? Do you think that's something that could fly? It, it, in theory, it should be in practice, no. Yeah. Um, VCs generally hate acquisitions. Uh, if there's anyone here who invests and wants to disagree with me, put your hand up. No, okay. Um, it, it, it's the, generally, investors don't like to see money going in and money going out mm. um, to fund a kind of deal like that. And typically, it hasn't been the model that's really worked for them. Mm. And, and yes, it is risky, to mm. be fair, although so is building a company. Um, I, I think given that you've got a lot of more and more startups, particularly over on the West Coast, are feature driven startups rather than startups that are really going to be full companies. Yeah. I think there's an awful lot of opportunities to put a couple of those together right now. In fact, you're probably going to see more and more of that over the next the next six or nine months. Okay. Um, I think people should think that way a lot more, you know, because at the end of the day, you got a finite amount of money, you got to get to traction, you've got to get to customers and any sense that there are rules that you should do it in this linear order is complete bollocks and you should forget that concept no matter who's telling you. And what inspired you to actually grow by acquisition rather than just trying to build a customer base yourself? I'm really impatient. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. Okay. I mean, it's, it, if there is a thing, if you have something that I want, mm -hmm. I'm just going to annoy the crap out of you until you give it to me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm just going to burgle you, or I'm going to kidnap you, or, or something. Or buy it. Or buy it is probably uh, more Yeah, <laughs> or, well, I'm going to get it. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's and I, like, a lot of people don't necessarily think that way, mm. good or bad, right? And it means that when you start doing things in the market, we've been very fortunate in that we've got a lot of traction organically, um, we've got great partnerships with companies, and we're now starting to get opportunities coming to us because we're out there actually doing things in the market, and we've got more momentum than anyone else. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah, you've, uh, from what I gather, you've been an Enterprise Ireland client with some of your previous companies. Um, a lot of us, for, for us in Ireland, Enterprise Ireland is one of the main funding bodies, and um, like it's it's a process that you need to go through sometimes if you want to get match funding you need to be a HPSU client and you can benefit from all these great things that they can give you and I know that you're a, an ambassador for their Start in Ireland program do you have any idea do you have any can you impart any wisdom as around, around the process of getting it to be HPSU fundable and getting through the process and, and engaging first and a very like at a very kind of at the beginning with Enterprise Ireland how have you what have you learned from that process um, pester power is good. Um, I, I mean, Enterprise, Ar benevolent. Enterprise Ireland are, are, are a pretty benevolent investor. Um, well, if they're not, you'll find me fired as ambassador next week. Um, uh, you know, you got to go to them with traction points and show them, hey, look, here's what we're doing. We've got some interest from these customers. We've got some interest from this kind of partner. It's fairly straightforward in that mm -hmm. respect. I think the biggest, the biggest piece of leverage that you can bring to bear is 
um, someone who isn't you or who isn't connected to you, mailing them, jumping on the phone to them saying, hey, these guys are awesome. What they're doing is cool. You should give them some money, right? Simple as that, and that will start to make doors open. Okay. Or, you know, come and, come and shout at the ambassadors. Come and shout at me and Paul and Liam and say, hey, uh, we should be getting in there. We should be HPSU. Uh, can you help us? And, you know, I think one of the, one of the very smart things that EI did although they may be regretting it now, I don't know, is sort of appointing these ambassadors because we're obviously outside. We're not exactly shy about speaking our mind. And, it, you know, we, we can actually say to them, look, that's stupid, that's stupid, don't do this, don't do that. We think you should do that. Yeah. Um, or you're being idiots over there. So, you know, I, I would, you know, use the ambassadors. Cool. Um, and tell us... Still waiting for diplomatic passport, though. How's my life? Um Tell me... Um, so in terms of raising money, have you ever raised VC money or a large VC round in the past? And tell us about that process. I mean, uh, one of the kind of really rational views, and it seems very simple that I've heard about approaching a VC is that you should go to them, like you said, with your action points or your, your metrics as to what you're trying to achieve in the next few months. To have a conversation with them, tell them what you go to, you're going to achieve, give them an idea of what exactly it is that you're trying to achieve in the next nine months. I'll come back at that point and we'll have a different conversation type of thing. Yeah, sort of. Um, I, 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 um, I live a funny life because I sort of sit on both sides of the table. So I'm, I'm, I'm an investor and in close to a couple of VC funds and I also go out and actively raise investment for our own things. So I, I have a fairly 360 degree view on the whole thing. Does everyone know how VC economics work? Does anyone not know what I'm talking about? Put your hand up. Okay, there's probably a lot more of it, right? So, I used to hate VCs, right? I used to want to punch them in the face. Um, because my experience would be I'd walk in, I'd say, hey, we're doing this awesome thing. Uh, it's going to be huge. Here's the market. Give me money. And they'd go, eh, we'll think about it. And I'd come back, and a couple of weeks later, it would be roughly the same sort of iteration. And they'd say, oh, we'll think about it. Um, and three or four months later, they'd go, actually, we're going to pass on this. Um, it's not you, it's us. Yeah. And I'd be like, guys, I don't care. You were giving me all the warm signals. What's the deal? The challenge for VC firms is that if you take a pot of, let's say, 100 million euros or any round number like that, um, something like uh, 40 to 50 million of that is going to disappear because the companies are going to die. You're going to get maybe 20 to 30 million of that capital back, which means for the remaining, let's call it 30 million, you essentially have to turn that 30 million into at least 130 million, okay? 30 million into 130 million, okay? Which means that, and, and like this is, I mean, I'm generalizing, but these are roughly the stats. And you can go read Mark Suster or, or, or any of those guys to get real details on this. Broadly, that's what it looks like. So when they're assessing a company, they know that, okay, there's, there's a one in three chance, uh, or probably close to one in, five, one in two chance you're gonna die. There's gonna be maybe a one in five chance you're gonna give me my money back which means I'm really banking on you to be the one in three uh, or one in, in, in almost four that's got to somehow quadruple the money, right? Yeah. Which leads to a lot of situations where VCs look at companies which are good companies, which can be interesting, which can grow, which can do really like uh, engaging things in the market, but they can't be big enough to generate that 4x return or 5x return or whatever it is. And that's the real problem, right? Yeah. So once you start understanding those economics, like with a lot of VCs, you can go and you can say, hey, here's what we're raising at. You know, tell me how your fund structure works. What would you be expecting in terms of return? What would you be expecting in terms of exit valuations? And um, you should have a conversation both ways so that you really understand where they're coming from. Because at the end of the day, you know, they have to make money. They're, if they don't make money on this fund, they're not gonna raise another fund. And it's really hard out there to raise VC funds at the moment. Really, really hard, probably harder than ever. Um, so it's good to understand that starting point. So if you're going in and you're saying to them, "Hey, we, we're going to raise, um, we're going to raise five million," um, and you go, "Okay, fine." So let's say you're going to give away thirty percent of the company for for uh, for five million. So your post um, your post valuation is going to be about what fifteen million. Okay. So after you've taken the investment, valuation of your company is fifteen million. Fifteen million multiplied by four is about sixty million. Right. So your company has to sell for at least 60 million for that VC to, to do Forex on, on, on their original investment. And in reality, it probably needs to be a little bit larger than that to cover off all the other shareholders. So the question for you going in there as a founder or, or as a company owner is, 
is your market big enough to sustain a $60 million company exit? Are there companies out there who will buy your company for $60 million? Lots of people, like when, when people pitch me with various things, I, you know, one of the first questions I ask, because I'm pretty mercenary about this, is, okay, who are, you, who are your exits? Who's going to buy you? And people, the, the people who are well prepared will list all these companies. And I go, okay, I'll point to one randomly and I'll say, what's their balance sheet like? And I'll usually get a kind of quizzical look going, what do you mean? Like they'd buy us because we fit this or this. And I go, get that. How much cash have they actually got in their balance sheet? And people don't think about that. Um, starting companies is in some ways easy. You start a company, you have an idea, boom, we've got a company. Investing in companies is really easy. I'm going to give you some money. I've invested. I'm an investor. Awesome. Making money out of these companies is really hard. Yeah. Really hard. And for VCs, I mean, <laughs> if I went back in time, um, a younger me would punch me in the face for saying this. But I do have a lot more sympathy for VCs because it is really hard to make money in this You're space. You just sound like a VC. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my point, my point is simply understand your investor and what their requirements are going to be. And you have to be realistic about the market, you know, because otherwise you're going to be wasting, you know, your time um, and theirs. I mean, you probably don't give a shit about theirs, but you do give a shit about yours, yeah. you know. So, uh, yes, you want to keep them in the loop, but you want to understand, okay, are they, are they a seed VC? Are they, are they later stage VC? Mm -hmm. Does your company and does your market fit with what they're trying to achieve? Okay. Um, you made some angel investments. Um, and tell us, is there, has there ever been a situation, and you don't need to name the companies if it's only, um, if it's only been a, a recent one or whatever, um, but has there ever been a point where you walk in and after 30 minutes of talking to someone, you agree to invest? Uh, I might have said I was going to invest, yeah. but I don't think it. Um, <laughs> I, I don't came back three months later and said, "No, it's not you. It's me." <laughs> <laughs> You'll go far. <laughs> um, no, never. I, I don't understand people who say yes in half an hour. I uh, well, okay. There's the Bay Area, and there's everywhere else in the world, yeah. right? The Bay Area is a different ecosystem. You, it's where you can have. Um, you know, extremely uniquely experienced people in a room and statistically you can probably bet on them. Mm -hmm. But that is rare. I mean, you look at what some of the, the, the ex-Facebook founders have done, like Path, Quora, eh, you know, and okay, maybe you'd bet on those people because they're ex-Facebook, but actually those products aren't really going anywhere. Mm -hmm. They're not very interesting. So, it, it, you know, even betting on that is risky. I, I don't know every market in the world. Most people don't. I need to go and research. I need to go and reference check. I want to go and talk to a bunch of other people who've invested in this sector. I've been, for, I've been looking at a bunch of payments companies, for example, over the last two, three, four weeks. There seems to be a lot of payment companies raising money at the moment. I'm not from the payment sector. I'm going to go and talk to a bunch of people who are much smarter than me, who actually know a thing or two about payments. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask them questions. I'm going to ask them to look at stuff. Um, I'm going to sort of you know, borrow favors off them and say, is this smart? If not, why? What do you think? How much money are they realistically going to need? Mm. Who's going to buy this? If they're in a big company, would you buy this? Okay, why would you buy this? When would you buy this? What's their window, right? I don't understand people who do that in half an hour. Um, there, there are a couple, I mean, if you look at maybe SV Angel and 500 startups and, and a few of those guys who are really doing super wide investing, mm. maybe they do that. But personally, no. Just okay. actually a note on that, you were talking about like the, the different type of human capital that's in that existence. One sec. Yeah, Has anyone on. ever invested on the basis of a 30 minute conversation? Well, you have, you, like you hear about right. angels in the valley and stuff like Jeff Clavier talking. Yeah. Valley's different. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell us actually, seeing as there is different kind of uh, human capital in, in Ireland and Silicon Valley, there's a lot more kind of sophisticated human capital in that there's a lot of investors that are really focused on one particular vertical or sector. Um, is there anything that you've learned from, as someone who actually has gone to the States and gone to different clus startup clusters around there, how, have you used any different mechanisms or bodies or, or different communities to get in touch with people that you really, really needed to get in touch with that you mightn't have been able to do on your own? Is there any, in, uh, for example, Silicon Valley, I mean, you had the Silicon Valley office of EI, who are obviously really good at that, but besides that, is there an Irish community over there that you've kind of benefited from, or is there any other? I know that Patrick Collison said that Y Combinator was one of the single biggest things that ever got them access to people well, that they needed to yeah. talk to. I mean, what, at this stage, Y Combinator is, is, is 
close to a, a Silicon Valley legend. I mean, it's, it's gold dust. <laughs> Um, I, I think in the early days of going out there, it was definitely the Irish network and tapping into to who, you knew, who you knew who was Irish, who could get you into places. Mm. Over time, that's definitely dissipated. And I think, you know, the, the Bay Area um, in particular, although lots of other places, works on introductions and references. And I, I would say the single biggest tool is still LinkedIn and, and, and people I know. And it's, it's just, you know, pinging a whole bunch of contacts saying, hey, I need to get to this corp dev person in this media company. Or, or literally what I do is, and th this is why I bring on board advisors, you know, in all of our companies, I'll send them lists. Um, so we'll be doing a particular thing, maybe it's investment or maybe it's a partnership for something or, or a specific thing. And I'll say, hey, here's 10 companies. Have you got contacts in them? If so, what are they and what are their titles? And that's why you have advisors to actually do that. You use Datahug. Uh, we use Datahug as well, actually. Big fan of Datahug, by the way. <laughs> Um, we do. Um, it's, it's really effective for that. But Datahug, LinkedIn, uh, and advisor networks. Um, you, you want an introduction from someone who is regarded and who is respected, sure. um, particularly in the Bay Area. You know, it was really easy to be friends with them. Also, you don't kind of recommend to be friends with them. So, um, just kind of develop the idea of finding co founder. <laughs> Talk to lots of people, dude. I mean, finding a co-founder is hard. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're gonna be looking within the same industry, you're gonna be looking within the same sector. You're gonna be looking, more importantly, for someone who's got the same drive as you. You know, find someone who replies to emails at 10 or 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Find someone who replies to emails over, over a weekend. Um, whatever things like that that you're looking for in someone, test people on that kind of basis. It's, it's not an easy thing. Um, and, you know, again, go through networks. Um, advertise, whatever. Really want to try and reach as many people who give a shit about the thing that you give a shit about as much as possible. Um, you get uh, many uh, interns through advertising. Would you use them? We got a few. I mean, you know, interns are. Um, what do I think of interns? There are. Sometimes there are really good interns, and most of the time there aren't. Um, sorry, interns. Um, and I, I think you're kind of, some people make the mistake of getting interns in because they go, oh, intern, fine, we'll just get them in. You're probably wasting your time if you take that approach. You, you, need to tra you need to treat intern recruitment in the same way you would any other kind of recruitment. You know, you get out of it what you put in. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with, uh, you know, some very, very good ones. Um, but others I've literally fired in half an hour. I mean, literally half an hour. Um, so if you're gonna make a decision like that, make it fast. Okay, this gentleman here, actually. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your experience in Jones online? Well, I actually haven't heard anything yeah, yet. That's kind of, yeah, we, kind of an open <laughs> question. <laughs> we kind of bypassed well, you, you, you told us very interesting stories about what was happening at Dienenberg. Could you tell us how it started, uh, how you got going, how you scaled it? Stuff? Yep, so uh, Jolt was a social games publisher which we started round about the same time that Zynga was starting. Uh, and at the time when we sort of announced that we were going to make games playable in your internet browser um, versus on your console, everyone laughed at us and said, people don't want simple basic games in your browser. They want super realistic things on your console. And we went, well, I, I don't think that's totally going to be the case. And then Zynga, Zynga launched and, and, and that whole sector exploded. So we were, at, I mean, at the time we were pitching investors and we were, the references we were using weren't um, in the Bay Area. They were uh, German browser game companies that no one had ever heard of because Germany was actually the leader of social gaming and free to play gaming well before anyone else in the world. Um, and we, we were coming up with these absolutely obscure references that no one had ever heard before. Um, so we raised some money and, and we started building some games and it, we were kind of one of the first in Europe to be doing it and we were really making it up as we went along. We made tons of mistakes um, in terms of thinking about how to monetize free to play um, because you know Zynga had only just started and was still relatively unknown um, even in the US at that point. I mean this was 08, yeah around about 2008. Um, and we, we did some interesting stuff early on where we, we licensed IP and turned them into social games. Uh, we also uh, rather infamously licensed Playboy to create Playboy Manager, uh, which is a whole set of stories that I can tell another time. Um, but suffice it to say, it did lead to lawsuits by some of our investors or threatened lawsuits. 
Um, I probably can't tell that one on camera. No. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was nearly injuncted for that, uh, which was amusing. Um, that'll come out in the book. Um, <laughs> And we, so we had essentially created the model. We, we were starting to make money out of these games. And uh, we were out fundraising at the time to raise our Series A. And it was 2009. Yeah, 2000, very end of 2009. And it was a pretty sucky market, actually, because it was post Lehman's end of the world. Um, and VC market was very tough. And one of the investors who were in, was in the mix was GameStop. And we'd actually partnered with GameStop earlier to do some retail testing. Uh, where we would um, work with them to essentially, rather than uh, doing online advertising to drive users into the game, do advertising in store, physical user acquisition, nice. um, in their stores uh, to see what would happen. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and the, the conversion rate was huge, absolutely immense. Uh, so we were acquiring users in store for a fraction of what we were doing, what we were spending online. Um, because to, to, to scale up, um, a social games publisher was a function of marketing spend. So you were spending X to generate Y in terms of revenue. So we were always going to need more capital. So one thing led to another. GameStop acquired the company. We became um, sort of their spearhead and in many ways, I guess, the blueprint for their digital media strategy, which was a fascinating time. I mean, you know, this was the biggest games retailer in the world. Pure bricks and mortar going, OK, we're going to transition into digital. Um, and I mean, Jesus, there's a whole book there. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, we rolled out in North America the biggest user acquisition system that I think anyone's ever seen that integrated with retail. So when a kid walked into to a GameStop store in South Carolina or LA or San Francisco or anything like that, and they bought a copy of Call of Duty and they went up to the till, the staff member would be prompted um, to give them a free physical promo card for one of our social games. But what we'd built behind the scenes was this huge internal leaderboard system for the stores. So all of GameStop's 50,000 staff could actually see their own store rankings across the company based on who was acquiring more users, who was acquire, acquiring more um, monetizable users. Um, and we, we were able to track that directly into the game. So it was very, very cool. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we kind of scaled it based on, we, based on that model. Then they acquired Congregate um, and started focusing on that, which was in San Francisco. Uh, and then they sort of decided to focus more on platform than content. Uh, so the Jolt Studio unfortunately got closed down. Uh, but there's a bunch of things that have spun up since Digit Gaming, which is looking very, very interesting. Um, but it was, it was a, it, like that retail experience was absolutely invaluable because it, it gave us um, insight into a world that you rarely see in, in, in digital or in online. It can be very powerful when harnessed right. Actually, it was actually really interesting. I remember you telling a story one time about how you were about to get acquired by Activision. And they had sent a team from San Francisco or from somewhere in the States over to Dublin to do some due diligence. And you were 26 at the time. And it was your birthday and you were sitting around a table and all these executives are over doing due diligence and they don't know what age you are. Uh, can you tell us that story? And, and about well, they've told <laughs> half of it now. <laughs> no, tell us. You've got to get better at asking get, questions. Get, you I'm, stop and then you get me I'm, I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. Tell us, that, tell us about that, but go further and tell us. What was it? <laughs> You're that? just going to do it again? <laughs> okay, so you stop, I'll talk. I'm making these questions up as I go on. I realize that, yeah. Noticed. No, um, tell us about doing business as a young entrepreneur. Um, and how relevant you see that, or, or do you think it is relevant to the whole? It, it, it's less relevant now. It was definitely relevant back then. I mean, like it, it's funny. There was, there was. It's hard to imagine there being much, much, much less writing on startups and what was going on in the Bay Area. But like ten years ago, it, it, there really wasn't all that, or there weren't all that many people doing what everyone is doing now. I mean, it's great to see so much of it. But back then, Jesus, we were pretending to be forty. Um, because we had to. I mean, we were like mid twenties. Um, we were responsible for, in many cases, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue being generated by these games on the basis of our services. You know, at the time, we were in an office above a tattoo parlor. Like, you couldn't make this shit up. You know, we'd be going to 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 meetings and things, and, and everyone would be talking about families and kids and holidays. Myself and Sean would be there nodding away, going, yeah, kids, yeah, married. And we were like, <laughs> no, no idea. Um, and that all sounds very normal now, but honestly, back then, you know, we were really pretending. So, you know, when Activision, you got to bear in mind, Activision and, and THQ, who are then alive, and Ubisoft, 
you know, this is a four, uh, at the time maybe $40 billion industry. And one of the structural companies, one of the most important technology pieces that they have, they come over to see and they're expecting to see, you know, an operation of professionals and really smart engineers, which they found. They just weren't expecting to see an average age of about 23 and a half. You know, so we were out for dinner with, with the lead, the diligence team who'd come over, which was, uh, was three or four of them. And there was a friend of mine at the table. And uh, by, I hadn't mentioned it was my birthday, none of this sort of stuff at all. And she, she didn't know what was going on. So she was like, oh, you're here for Dylan's birthday. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, but shut up. Shut up. <laughs> and and the, the dude, um, the guy from Activision was sitting beside her was going, yeah, really, birthday, what age is he? And she's like, 26. And I just see his head just kind of go, oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's like, we're, they're, what age? And they, they're responsible for how much of our revenue? And, um, and I was kind of like, that was the point where I thought, oh, balls, this deal isn't going to happen. Um, and actually, there were a few of those. Um, but that was definitely one of them. Like, when you're, when you're going through deals and acquisitions, there are so many moments where, you know, that they're just holy shit moments where you think everything is going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, like, I nearly came to physical blows with one of their lawyers, um, actually, on that Activision deal. I swear to Christ. Um, For what exactly can we ask? They that? were being morons. Um, they were, there was a, like, I, I've, I've a problem with a lot of Irish lawyers and I've kind of been on the record as talking about this before. Irish lawyers, anyone here? Lawyers? Come on, I'm sure there's one. Hey, dude, hello, hello, hello. Um, a lot of Irish, a lot of Irish lawyers, not all, not all. But there was, there was, uh, there is frequently, and you see this with, with a lot of English lawyers as well. Less so Americans, I find, for whatever reason. Um, there, there was a lack of commercial um, experience. And you had this American company com coming in, making their first acquisition in Europe. And the, the local law firm who was representing them here in, in Dublin was essentially just giving them the whole belt and braces approach. It's like, you should do all of this diligence and you should give them all of these warranties and you should probably genetically test them and make them warrant, you know, Northern Ireland as well. Um, and, and, and Activision were going, because they were, you know, they hire lawyers to give them advice. And Activision were going, well, okay. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but if you say so, sure, fine. And we were kind of seeing this, and our lawyers were going, look, that's a bit unreasonable, and that's a bit unreasonable. And Activision were going, well, look, we're being told we should do this, so we should do it. And it really, it got absolutely out of hand. I mean, our Christ, our legal fees at the end of it were ridiculous. I suppose, again, does it come back to the sophisticated human capital, and you have, like, tech-savvy solicitors in the States, and you have tech-savvy accountants, and so on? I don't think, do find... it's not, it's not tech-savvy, it's commercial experience. Because you don't, you like, it is about being in situations where you're able to grasp that the commercials of a deal make this particular point important and this particular point not important, or at least less important, rather than going, all of this is priority. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, that, that, there are certain partners and certain firms in Ireland who get that, but that, that commercial experience is really, really lacking. Okay. And, and we, like, I've seen that on other deals as well. Um, and, and it's, it's the one thing that can really put a strain on getting a deal done. What did you do to overcome that with the recent acquisition? Did you do any, put any measures in place to kind of make sure that you wouldn't fall into that kind of Yeah, a we kind of, like, it's, it's, it, there's two approaches that we take to any acquisition now, whether we're being acquired or we're acquiring or anything like that. One is um, have a really, really big term sheet which sounds almost madness, right? But if you can get, because I remember we were presented with a VC term sheet for one of the other companies a couple of years back from a, a very good US VC. In fact, we, we had like three term sheets on the table. One was Irish, one was UK, and one was American. The, Irish, uh, the American one was 10 pages long. The UK one was uh, six or seven pages long. And the Irish one, I swear to God, was two pages, right? Mm -hmm. And we were kind of looking at this going, well, that's a bit funny. I mean, the Irish one looks kind of nice. Two, two, two pages? Fine, we'll do that. Okay. Whereas the American one was like, Jesus, we're going to be here a week. Um, and it's one of those experience things. The more stuff you can get agreed up front in a term sheet, right, the thorny stuff, the better the actual um, transaction is going to be. Because there's a bunch of arguments you need to have about various things. And if you can get them agreed in that term sheet piece, which is usually where most of the energy, in, in, in an M&A deal, there'll be a huge, when people decide that they're gonna try and do it, there'll be a lot of activity and energy focused on getting the term sheet done. 
That's the sprint. And then your actual long form is your marathon, right? And it's when you have the arguments in the marathon that people start to get tired. So the more stuff you can get into that term sheet um, and agree up front that when it comes up in the long form, you've already decided. Yeah. And that, that's get a really big term sheet and decide everything there. Big term sheets keep the physical blows at bay, do they? Yeah, sort of. Cool. Well, um, and make sure your lawyers have commercial experience. Really, really, really do. How do you do that? How do you find out? What are the checks? I, I mean, I've thrown our own, our own lawyers out of a room at times because um, they just, you know, they weren't grasping the point. It's like, that is not important. Why don't waste my time or their time? But is it almost such that you can't find, unless you have a really, really trusted referral for, for a so, so get So get, like get a trusted referral. Come and ask me. I'll, I'll give you a list of five lawyers in Dublin who are good okay. partners. It's, you can't, it's not even a single firm. It will be specific people within law firms. Anyone else have any questions for Dylan? Yeah. Um, actually, this guy down here had it up first. We'll do them all, but this guy. Sorry, Dylan. Uh, you mentioned um, at the pitching stage, mentioning exit opportunities. And uh, do you think then that the companies should uh, be working towards that exit and have that in mind, uh, and is that a risk ultimately in that then being focused on the original goal as opposed to the goal that presents itself? Uh, and also, is there a risk if you, when approaching, let's just say yourself as an investor, um, and if, I, if, if someone were to say, the exit is going to be such and such a company, but then as you drift away from uh, that obvious direction, you know, will the investor become disenfranchised because um, what they were promised as the exit uh, yep. is suddenly moving away. That, that is a really, really, really good question. Um, exits, like, I, I find investors often fall into two buckets. There's the ones who want to talk seriously about exits and the others who want to just go and tell you to make something awesome. I, I fall into the former category, which perhaps means I'm a much more conservative human being than I ever thought. Um, I think any investor wants to understand or wants to know that you understand your market and that you understand, okay, what is going on here? What are the other players doing? And even if you're, you know, should you build towards a specific exit with a specific company? No, definitely not. But, you know, you got to be mindful of your surroundings, you know, so you have to understand where those guys are going. If you know that there's three major companies in your sector who are essentially building what you're building already, you know, that's a problem. Um, so you need to think about that. So I, I don't think, no, I mean, understanding what, what, what the landscape looks like is the most important thing. Understanding, you know, to my point about how much cash have people got on their balance sheet, I don't think probably anyone really um, expects that in a pitch. I mean, I'm a bit of a bollock, so if I ask you, yeah, I probably do expect it. But, um, you know, no investor is going to punish you in terms of the company changing direction or the product changing direction, because that's totally normal. But it's, it's being able to do that and be able to say to investors, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're pivoting here or we're changing the product or this is going to be the focus. Um, here's why, here's the landscape, here's who we're competing with, and um, here's where this goes. Uh, you know, a lot of investors will say, well, look, you know, the exit takes care of itself. Um, sometimes it does. Um, a lot of the time, it, it's a little bit more deliberate than that. Um, so I think the most important thing that you can do is be mindful about it, have a slide on it, and at least explain the rationale for why either a company or a category is going to want to acquire you. But you'll find different investors, so you kind of got to, gotta, you know, focus or adjust your pitch depending. Cool. It's a really good question. All right, next question. Let's get here. Well, yeah, you just shout. Yeah. Uh, your product discoveries uh, and basically your uh, like you know growth stories don't fit exactly into the textbooks. <laughs> and I think there is True. a new like uh, term for that uh, growth hacking. Oh no! No, okay. no. <laughs> that's, that's that buzzword gone out. Yeah, but uh, my question would be, you know, are there any books, anything you would uh, recommend to read? In general. In this regard. I hear the new J.K. Rowling thing is a page <laughs> Um Any books? Uh, Jesus, loads of books. Um, I mean, you can nearly read too much at this stage. Um, I, I think from, from a... Mark Suster's blog is great. Mark Suster's blog is excellent. Um, I, I've, 
Jesus, I, I can tweet a bunch of links out later on, but um, if you want to learn about VCs and how VCs think, Mark Suster is required reading. Both sides of the table.com. Yeah. There you go. Um, I think uh, avc.com, uh, what's his face? Yeah, Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson Union Square Ventures is very good as well. On growth. On growth? It really depends what sector you're talking about. Uh, I mean, growth, a lot of growth strategy is about experimenting with your product and with your market. Um, but like, what I tend to do is look at an awful lot of competitor products and see what they're doing uh, or what they've done historically. Um, I, like, grow, th this notion of growth hacking is, it's kind of bollocks. Um, because a lot of it is, is just experimenting with a whole bunch of things um, and then spending a chunk of marketing money on stuff. I'm simplifying to a point, right? Sometimes you can find really clever, clever little viral loops, but a lot of growth hacking harks back to before Facebook started, you know, uh, closing an awful lot of doors, and it's just not as possible anymore. Like, okay, people talk about Dropbox's approach and how they kind of hack their growth to get really, really big. They they did to a point, but you got to bear in mind that you know a lot of companies grow or appear to be growing very fast because they say that they're growing very, very fast. I can say lots of things, but you don't know my actual numbers, so you don't really know what I'm doing, here, right? And a lot of the stories that are put out there and a lot of the blogs and interviews, and I'm not saying people are lying for a second, not at all, but you're positioning in the market and saying, hey, we've got a team of growth hacking geniuses in London. They're awesome. Immediately, you're more interested in what we're doing because I'm saying that. In reality, They've probably gone in and done a lot of categorization and a lot of, you know, um, direct contact with people. Some of the best growth hacking I've seen is physically sitting down with potential customers going, hey, here's our product, look at it. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, what's his face uh, uh, in, in YC talked about the Paul, the, the, the Paul Graham talked about the Carlson method where the boys used to literally sit people down and just install the tech for them and, you know, physical installation done. Um, I think the guys behind Pinterest, which languished for about 18 months, started getting traction because they used to organize little parties with the few users that they had to get together and talk about it. Growth hacking is a retrospective term that makes the grind look easy and polished. Yeah. There's no, there's 999 times out of a thousand, there's no easy hack. It's interesting actually, one, one time I was at, um, asked, a similar question was, what is the strategy to actually have a product, or what is the difference between a product that could be excellent and flounders, and a product that's kind of okay and, and can go viral, um, to use the word. But, uh, and one of the examples I was given was MailChimp, and apparently in the first days of MailChimp, you had a product that was built where they, as Dylan said, they sat down with the customer, basically built a mold around the customer for what they needed, and then just went and built that. And because of the nature of the industry, they got tons of yeah. ear space I mean, because of that. I mean, I, you know, my, my only, or my overriding point on this is that building companies is hard, building products are hard. There's some great writing out there, but it's generally pretty short form writing and it deliberately glosses over a lot of the details. Mm -hmm. If you're finding this stuff difficult, it's because it's difficult. That is just the reality of it almost all of the time. I think like if you take, um, if you take the kids market, for example, you know, a lot of people, pointed at the huge big viral successes that, that um, Mashi Monsters has been, for example. Mashi Monsters spent a huge amount of money very, very effectively on TV advertising. Um, you know, people talk about this, this, this kind of playground word of mouth. It generally only comes after a lot of marketing money has been spent. Now, they spend it very cleverly and they do an awful lot of testing, but you find the thing that works or maybe it's five things that work and you start to put money towards those. You know, but actual viral word of mouth, when you dig into the data behind the scenes, is often actually a lot more artificial and deliberate than you think. Cool. Actually, okay, um, we're gonna take three more very, very quick questions because I know it's getting late. And, well, it's quite warm. And I'll we'll answer questions till, till yeah. you're telling me to go. Cool. But, you know. um, so, David Scanlon, just one question. Do you wanna just shout it? Oh, there we go. He's got the mic. Hey, Dave. Most startups fail. Uh, how does the founder know when to quit and when to just keep on flowing more? Um, when they, I don't know. 
What kind of a question is that? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, you could just you could just sense the uh, you, anguish you, across the audience when you, you ask that how question. How do you know when to quit? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Well, I I don't know, right? I mean, you you some people don't. Oh, that's a different question. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's almost impossible to answer in a general kind of way um, because there are, uh, there are several categories of founders, some of which will look at the situation objectively and go, this isn't working, we're flatlining, we've tried 20 things, we're going to call it a day. And, you know, you assess it and you go, okay, fine, totally get it, didn't work, got it. There's other people who are borderline um, mentally unstable who will just go and drive something and drive something and drive something and somehow grind their way um, into making it work. And, and there's plenty of those there and there's plenty of success stories and there's plenty of like the opposite thing as well that you obviously just don't hear about. From an investment point of view, it, it's tricky because you usually go in and you just ask a whole bunch of obvious questions. And as the founder, you're sitting there going, yeah, look, yes, 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 or no, whatever the case is. Um, so I think it really depends. The most important thing you can have in those situations is industry data, as in what is happening to other people. And I mean, what's really happening to other people. Like, I I'm in the somewhat privileged position that I get to see a lot of data on a lot of companies in Europe. You would be shocked at what is really going on behind the scenes with some of the bigger companies out there. Like, you'll read the stories and it is, it is not the case. I know everyone is always killing it. Great. But sometimes as an investor, you see what's actually going on and you see their numbers and they're, they're totally flat and they're not going anywhere. Um, and that's where it's useful to know whether your company is, is are they not executing because um, the team isn't good enough or they tried the wrong things? Or is it because the market is only this big um, and actually everyone else is going through the same sort of problems? A lot of the, the challenges with investing, particularly in the consumer space at the moment, is that everyone is still investing at a very early stage when, when, when product growth is just straight up like that. I mean, you take the OMG pop situation, right? It went up and came down. And you look at mobile game companies and their product life cycles are getting shorter and shorter. So, you know, you invest at the start and you go, holy shit, this thing is going to be huge. And then all of a sudden, the natural curve um, kicks in and you go, oh, bulls. And no one realized that. But you look around and you find actually there's five other companies in that sort of situation. So the best thing you can do is look at data, ask whether other people are going through it and find out where you stand contextually. It's probably the most useful thing. Uh, Dan? Uh, speaking of data, Facebook, um, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, I don't believe in their business model. I don't think, it's, I don't think they know how to make money <coughs> yet. You don't you believe in what? I don't believe in their business model. That's my opinion. <coughs> but in Facebook's, in Facebook's business in their, model? In their monetization strategy. How many billion are they turning over? Five, five billion last year. I heard. understand they're, that they're doing well now, but do you see that <coughs> they... Do you, where do you see Facebook in two years from now? <coughs> um, I think historically... <coughs> you asked me what books I read. I read a lot of history books. Historically, everything is, is, is cycles. Um, there will be a successor to Facebook. That will happen. Um, I, I've, we, because we've got a small research arm in our company, we see an awful lot of data about what kids are using. I don't know what the next Facebook is going to be. I can tell you with reasonable certainty, or conviction at least, that it is going to be a much more transient type of experience. If you look at things like Snapchat in particular, you know, uh, you're looking at a photo and then it's gone. There's no real permanence to it. Kids are very, very, very comfortable with that. Um, you look at how music consumption has essentially switched to a streaming model across the board and that's totally accepted. Um, there is going to be a successor to Facebook and there'll be a successor to that. It will be a more transient thing. Where Facebook goes, I don't know. I mean, they, got, they do have a big revenue model there. Um, I think they, their product innovation is, is going to be a challenge. But there, there will always be new, new things. Um, you can bet on that. Okay, one more. Um, let's start. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you are researching <coughs> payments and uh, payment processing companies. Uh, could you share your insight on? 
opportunities? Can I tell you everything I know? <laughs> um, well, it's a good question. Um, okay, let me, let me, let me, what, what can I say usefully? There are, in the world of payments, which I am not an expert on, so I, 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 all of my comments are based on speaking with people who are much smarter than I am and, and, and looking at a lot of information. The world of payments is much more conservative and much more established and much more permanent than most people think. It is a surprisingly easy sector to enter because you come in promising disruption in terms of how payments are processed or how money is transferred or things like that. As you start to scale, you realize that there are some very, very, very big companies and they essentially own all of the infrastructure, which means that ultimate success, although you might have early success, ultimate long-term success is going to be a real challenge unless A, you're phenomenally well capitalized um, or B, you manage to somehow build your own infrastructure or possibly a combination of the above. So there's some really interesting companies out there at the moment. Um, and I, I think a lot of investors tend to get overly excited by early revenue growth. Um, a lot of the big private equity investors look at all the activity in the payment startup space at the moment and they're scratching their heads going, guys, we know how this plays out. Like all, all of this stuff is done. You know, the, all the major, um, the, the biggest e-commerce companies in the world, um, their payment partners are locked up. They're not going to change. Um, and I think a lot of payment companies don't really think about this. They don't think about things like fraud rate. Um, they don't think about things like acquisition costs. There's a lot of big payment companies out there who are starting to roll new things, and they've got huge mass and momentum behind them. So payment is, it's interesting. There's disruption that's going to happen, but I would go into it very, very eyes open. Um, you know, just because you can disrupt a bit of it, doesn't mean that you can disrupt the actual infrastructure piece, which you probably need to do. Okay. <clears throat> All right, cool. Well, I think we're going to leave it at that. Listen, I would like to, again, thank Dylan for coming along, and uh, it's great for Pleasure. you to take your time out. <laughs> All right. <laughs>